Welcome to today's webinar. We're going to get started in just a few moments. So again, just welcome to everyone who is joining us right now. We're just going to get started in a few moments. We're just letting people sign in right now. For those who are just signing in right now, uh, like I said, we're just getting, we're just letting people, we're going to get started in a few moments. You can go ahead and uh, uh, put in your questions in the uh, question box, and we'll get to the questions at the end of the webinar today. Uh, so just be a few moments more. Hello, Caitlin. It seems that you're you're you've logged in there. Yeah. Hello, Caitlin. So we're just waiting for our presenter here to, to get logged in. Okay, so we're just gonna, uh, like I said, just wait a few more moments while a few more people get signed in. Caitlin, can you hear us? Hello, Caitlin. Can you hear me, Hunter? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, I can't hear you. Um, let's see here. So while we're waiting for Caitlin, 
uh, I'm just going to go through and uh, just to introduce some people to this format, so our webinar format. If this is your first webinar that you are attending uh, with, with Landlord BC, um, welcome. Uh, though I do see quite a few familiar uh, names of people who are attending today's webinar, so thank you for, for coming back uh, to, our, to our webinar series. Today's webinar is on privacy in the digital age. And it's, it's a topic that we've covered actually a few times in the past, but one that does seem to, to it changes quite a bit um, throughout, uh, throughout the years. Uh, policies change, technology changes, uh, the way that we use technology changes, and certainly recently technology has certainly uh, become much more important to our businesses as rental housing providers. So we've invited uh, Caitlin Lemiski from the Office of the Information Privacy uh, Commissioner's Office uh, to present on, on this very important and evolving topic. Before we get into uh, Caitlin's presentation, uh, if you, I know that I think a large amount of people who have signed in today are Landlord BC members. For those who are not our members, um, the contact information from our Director of Member Engagement is up on the screen right now. Kimberly Coates, as mentioned, is our Director of Member Engagement, and she can talk to you about membership options. Just a little bit of information about Landlord BC itself. Uh, we are a not-for-profit uh, association that represents landlords and property managers across the province. Um, we do this, and our, and our mandate specifically is, is advocacy and education. Uh, so we advocate to the government at all levels, and we provide education to landlords and property manager and rental housing professionals uh, of all kinds uh, across, like as is mentioned, across the province. Uh, today's webinar itself is made possible by our sponsor, Hattingen Company. Uh, serving residential landlords for almost two decades, Hattingen Company is a recognized leader and trusted advisor to housing providers, the housing providers uh, in the residential housing industry. They're, we are proud of our long association with Lander BC and look for opportunities to share our expertise with Lander BC and look for opportunities to share our expertise with Lander BC members, either in education forums. So you may have seen Hattingen Company at some of our past webinars and in-person workshops, um, or by looking after the best interests of our landlord clients. The broad-based clientele look, look to them to provide peace of mind and reasonable solutions, and they deliver. They love what they do, and they're good at it. The contact information for Haddocking Company is on the screen, as you can see. Uh, you can contact Grant Haddock at 604-983-6670 or info at haddock-co.ca or www.haddock-co.ca. So uh, now we're going to move into our webinar. Caitlin, are you, are you ready? Are you able to hear us? Caitlin, are you there? It looks like we may have, be having some technical difficulty. I'm just going to contact Caitlin and see if we can get this sorted out. To Zoom, enter your meeting ID followed by... Hello, Caitlin, can you hear us now? Yes, I can, Hunter. I'm extremely sorry. I do this all the time, and I just don't know what's gone wrong. <laughs> no problem. Well, that, you know, it's, it's apt that this is happening on our uh, webinar about, you know, privacy in di the digital world. Um, <laughs> so, you know, this, this does happen, certainly. Um, are you able to share your screen? Um, yes, I'm trying to do that. Um, I have... I have you up, um, I have it up on my computer and I'm just using my iPhone for audio. So let's take a look here. We'll just give it one minute. I'm sure we'll figure it out. Definitely. Great. Sorry, everyone who has tuned in. 
Um, here, I'm going to share my screen. Good. Good. All right, excellent. So are you seeing my screen now? We are. Wonderful. All right, so I, I saw you speaking. I'm sure you've done uh, the introductions already. Shall I just get right into it? Yeah, uh, you just might want to change the screen that we're seeing. We see oh, the uh, presentation. <laughs> certainly, thank you. Um, I am going to drag and drop. There we are. Oh, it's still the same. It <laughs> Um, there you go. <laughs> Thank you, Hunter. All right, wonderful. Well, I'll jump right into it then and speak for about half an hour. And um, I don't know if you can see me or not, but you can see my screen. That's the important thing. So um, the OIPC was established in 1993. We're an independent office of the legislature. And I'll just spend a few minutes speaking about us in the event that as a landlord, um, you end up, um, it, someone makes a complaint and you're dealing with our office. So I can talk a little bit about our process. Uh, we enforce the Public Sector Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. We also enforce the Personal Information Protection Act, which is what will be the focus of the discussion today. Um, you should know as well that um, Michael McAvoy, the commissioner, also acts as the Registrar of Lobbyists and enforces the province's Lobbyists Registration Act. We do have the power in British Columbia to investigate and to issue orders, public reports, uh, and other findings. Not all provinces have that power, but we do here in BC. All right, so I know um, that we have a large audience today and there will be various levels of knowledge. So I apologize in advance if I'm going over some points that some of you may already know. But just for the sake of those um, who are not very familiar with PIPA, I'll spend a few minutes going over the law before we get into sort of the nitty gritty of privacy issues related to landlords and tenants. So um, PIPA governs how organizations collect, use, store, disclose, and protect personal information. Um, it recognizes the rights of individuals and the needs of organizations. And landlords are legally obligated to abide by PIPA. Um, it's a consent-based statute. So just a few words on this. Um, certainly the act is not trying to give all the power to the individuals, and it's not trying to give all the power to the organizations or the landlords. It's seeking to balance those interests. Um, it is a legal obligation, so as I'll get into it on the presentation, if, for example, a landlord were to do something offsite of PIPA, an individual does have a right to complain, and in a very small number of cases, if an organization or landlord refuses to comply with the Act, we can order them to comply and get a court to enforce that order. Um, the last thing I want to say about this slide is that oftentimes people speak uh, in their personal lives about a reasonable expectation of privacy, or we hear in the criminal law uh, aspect, the reasonable expectation of privacy. That concept doesn't actually translate into PIPA. PIPA is really all about collecting personal information, whether it's video surveillance or an application form, using it for certain purposes, storing it, so keeping it secure and making sure there's not a privacy breach, and then in some circumstances, disclosing it. So if there was a reference check or in the event the police came with a police file and were seeking information from you about a tenant. Um, because we are in COVID times, I've got a couple of slides here about cloud computing. And I, I guess I can't stress enough, you know, as director of policy at the OIPC, this is probably the biggest issue that I deal with all the time in both the public sector and the private sector. Um, and I'm very fortunate because I think a lot of people, you know, we see the internet as this seamless thing. And unless we work in this area, or unless we um, deal with security professionals often like I do, you don't really, it's, it's hard to conceptualize how the information is traveling. So the, I hope these two slides are, they're probably the most important, I would say, takeaway of today, if you're not familiar with cloud computing. So <laughs> I've done this little drawing. So the way it used to be was, you know, you would be at your desk, um, you'd have a computer in front of you, you'd have your tower, which was your computer, your C drive, and all your data would be on there. So, you know, you might have um, Word documents on there, you might have a scanner and scan application forms, you might have photographs of uh, the units that you manage, and that would all be stored in your office or in your home on your computer. So today that model has completely changed. 
And this is uh, the part where, you know, it's, it's not all bad, but it certainly increases the risk. So it's important to kind of know where the data is. So as we see here, we've got, you know, the user, you, you've got your computer, and then really that tower and monitor is just an empty vessel. It's a conduit for you to access where your data actually is. And as you'll see from the picture of the screen, or the globe, pardon me, it's really on servers all over the world. Um, so this is not prohibited by PIPA, but just to be aware that um, anytime you're dealing with a company, like Google is a really common example. So Google, I believe they have 12 to 15 redundancies so that if you're sending an email to a prospective tenant who lives a kilometer away, that email and about 12 copies of it are actually being stored in servers all over the world. Um, so um, I think the takeaway here is that particularly if you're dealing with a new service, so you know Google, Microsoft are quite well known, but if there's a new app or program, it's just important to know that like that data is not on your phone and you should do a little bit of research ahead of time um, to make sure, for example, that the servers are not in a country where it's widely known that law enforcement, you know, controls that information. It would be better to have it at a country where um, there's some controls in place about um, how the data is secured. So here's just some tips for dealing with the new way, AKA cloud computing. Um, have a dedicated email address for your business. Um, I think that this is really important. I've had um, a security professional describe it to me as um, asset classification. And just as in the analog world, we would have different file folders in our filing cabinet for say our personal lives and our lives as a, as a landlord, it's really good to have um, a dedicated email address. Um, one practical example is under PIPA, individuals can ask for a right, uh, pardon me, for um, copies of their personal information. So if you have the email address, you just search their name on that account um, and all that information is going to come right up. Uh, know where your data is and who has it, so do a little bit of research ahead of time. And I think just to expand on that point a little bit, um, certainly in our private lives, you know, we don't have this obligation to figure out where our data is. But the second that you're dealing um, as an organization and subject to PIPA, all of these requirements come into play. So it just requires a little bit more due diligence, whereas you might feel com uh, comfortable using an app in your personal life, it may not be appropriate to use it uh, in your professional life. Um, so Facebook Messenger is, is probably a really easy example. Um, there have been, as I think most people know, uh, you know, numerous uh, compliance issues with Facebook. So a, a program like that that is demonstrated to kind of use information in other ways that, that might not be obvious to somebody um, isn't as secure as using something like an open source app that has end-to-end -end encryption. And even if you don't know anything about that, if you or, or another landlord Google, you know, end-to-end uh, -end encryption messaging, you'll very quickly be able to see a variety of applications that you can download on your phone. And it's a lot more secure to communicate that way than, say, on a Facebook chat. Um, have a pre-made email explaining how you collect, use, and disclose data. Um, I think tenants and individuals generally are becoming a lot more aware of their privacy rights. So if you have the time to have an email, uh, first of all, that you can just send to them if they ask for it, then that's, that will save you a lot of time and, and stress. Um, I'd also recommend that you try to give people paper-based options if they want to keep their data offline. This is not an explicit requirement in PIPA, but we have uh, many complaints that come to our office where individuals are really not comfortable for a variety of reasons putting their information online, and often a simple um, way to get around that is just to make an exception for that one individual to do a paper-based application if they feel really strongly about it, um, or if the information is particularly sensitive. Um, Respond to folks who have questions or make complaints about how you've collected, used, or disclosed their data. Uh, again, that's just a requirement under the Act, and it's also a great time saver because a lot of times it will prevent people from coming to our office, um, and it can just save you time so you can go about your life and the other work that you do in addition probably to being a landlord. So just generally going back to that concept of the globe with all of the computer servers, um, most companies, there's a lot of them, um, 
are in jurisdictions around the world that have good privacy laws. There's a few of them that aren't. Um, but just in terms of taking a look, um, the EU has the strongest privacy protection in the world. So, for example, I have a personal email account uh, that's out of Germany, and I feel really comfortable with that because I know that the servers are located in Germany and it's uh, subject to really strong privacy protections. So that was a really intentional move on my part. Um, the United States does not have a very strong level of privacy. I'll tell you right now, we don't prohibit people from using Gmail. We don't prohibit people from using Hotmail. Um, it's just something to think about. If you've got a couple of options and one's in the EU or one's in the States, the EU does have the stronger privacy laws currently. Um, California has a really strong consumer privacy law, but it only applies to Californians. Um, and Canada's got really good privacy protection as well. So a lot of your um, telcos will have their own email services providers located in Canada. And this becomes helpful. I mean, I won't go on too much. I'm only planning on speaking for about 35 minutes, and then I'll turn it over for questions. Um, but if there's a privacy breach, right, it just really helps. If, you're, if, the, if all the data of your tenants is located halfway across the world in a country where you can't speak the language or you can't access it, it's going to be more difficult if that company has a breach than if you're dealing with a company that you can um, communicate with effectively. Okay, so certainly uh, whenever I speak to groups of landlords, surveillance is a really big question that comes up for obvious, understandable reasons. You have very valuable assets that you're managing and you've got people coming in and out of there. So surveillance and privacy law is an ongoing sort of um, issue in jurisdictions all over Canada and the world. So we do have some tips on our website and I've got some here. The single biggest tip I would give you is to have a written policy about where you have cameras, the hours uh, that record, uh, when they're recording, pardon me, um, and a contact number to answer questions. Um, and this is if you decide to have surveillance. I could probably speak for half an hour about, about the pros and cons of it, but PIPA does impose really strong restrictions. So it may be that in your private life, in your own house, you have cameras set up every, you know, external cameras, internal cameras, that's absolutely fine. But once you become a landlord and you're managing some property and you're subject to PIPA, there are a lot more restrictions. And um, I think two of the biggest barriers are it has to be reasonable and, and the test of reasonableness is not whether you think it's a reasonable it's whether it's objectively reasonable like why is it objectively reasonable to have surveillance here and if you start off with a policy before you hit go on the cameras um, that will really help you work out the reasons why you have the surveillance in the event that the regulator or a tenant or another individual complains or asks questions um, another practical problem with video surveillance is that under pipa an individual has a right that they don't have to consent to, to something that is beyond what would be required for a product or service. So if I go into the grocery store and I want to buy a liter of milk and they ask me, you know, my dating history and my favorite color, I can say to them, no, I'm not telling you that. I don't need that in order to buy this liter of milk. You know, I'll give you my credit card number, but that's it. So um, with surveillance, um, if you didn't have a really kind of strong reason to have it in the first place, where it was necessary to provide the tenancy to have the camera, um, it, like let's say in a garbage collection area and you've got cameras up in the garbage collection area, it's possible a tenant might say to you, you know, under PIPA, I don't need to be filmed when I'm taking out my trash and I would like you to turn off the cameras when I take out my trash. And we don't have case law on that yet, but that, that kind of issue might well succeed in the tenant's favor if there's not good justification for the reasonableness for having the cameras up in the first place. Um, so that kind of goes to the bullet, only use surveillance in areas that warrant it. Um, definitely have a retention and destruction schedule. So frequently we tell people, you know, if you've got cameras, they should film over kind of every 24 hours or so. Um, if there's an incident, then you're probably going to know about it and then go check the footage pretty darn quickly. Um, it could be longer if it's a property where, you know, it's only reasonable that you would check it every five days, then that would potentially also be acceptable. It all depends on the circumstances. Um, and the last bullet would be a tip. If you're recording anything more than images, like if you're doing audio or thinking about that or facial recognition technology, um, I do suggest that you give us a call first. Um, that certainly is more uh, legally murky than, than having simply a CCTV system. Um, I did mean to say at the outset that our, uh, we have different departments here at the Privacy Commissioner's Office. 
and um, I head up the policy department, and we're really here for you. We serve the public. This is a proactive thing. You can call us up. You don't have to tell us who you are, and you can say, look, I have this question. You know, if a landlord wanted to do X, what would you think? And we'll give you our best uh, opinion as to what we think the PIPA means. Um, it still means that someone could complain to our investigations department and it would go through that channel, but we're just sort of here as a public resource um, to help people um, navigate their way through, through BC's privacy laws. So um, perhaps as Hunter has mentioned, um, we do have a private sector guide uh, for landlords and tenants. It was updated in September 2019, and I am very, very appreciative of the uh, expertise uh, that, um, that Landlord BC um, offered to our office in developing these guidelines. They were really, really um, helpful, and, and it was very valuable uh, collaboration, so thank you for that, Landlord BC. So this guide is about 12 pages long, it's on our website, and it just addresses um, common questions and it explains some of the definitions. So I certainly suggest you have a look at that if you're ever having a privacy issue or would like to learn more. So as I said earlier in the presentation, PIPA is a consent-based law. Um, there are some times where you can disclose information without consent, but in most cases, you know, you're going to be getting the prospective tenant to um, sign uh, the application form um, and just making sure that the information you're asking is reasonable and appropriate. Uh, a tenant with, can withdraw consent. Um, little note about withdrawing consent. So you can't withdraw consent under the act if it's necessary for processing it. So I mean, if you need certain information in order to rent to this person and they say, well, no, I'm not going to give it to you, then you absolutely have the right under PIPA to say, well, I can't do business with you because you're not giving me what I need. Um, it's sort of the difference when we fill out forms and you know, it's the optional category as opposed to the necessary category. Consent does not have to be in writing under the act, but we certainly encourage that because it leaves uh, proof that the individual did consent. Um, and in some cases, there's always exceptions. So one of them would be if um, police come to you with a court order demanding information about one of your tenants, you can absolutely give them that information without consent. So that really goes back to the purpose of PIPA, which is set out in Section 2 of the Act, to really try and strike a balance between the interests of organizations and landlords and of consumers and individuals. Okay, so... Um, before a tenancy, um, actually, I meant to have, oh, yes, I've got my next slide here. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Right, so you can, I mean, hopefully this is stuff that will all be uh, intuitive and common ground for all of us on the, on the webinar today. So, you know, you can check a tenant's ID to make sure who they are. Uh, you cannot photocopy it and keep it. Um, previous tenancies, you know, that you can ask information about that. Uh, references. Um, certainly wanting to keep it to information related to suitability as a tenant. Um, just a note on that, I mean, certainly, again, in our personal lives, um, we might want more information about somebody before we become friends with them or before we date them or something like that, and that's okay in that context. But in the landlord-tenant relationship, it is a stricter, uh, there are stricter requirements in place. So even if you're curious about something, you, you can't ask for it. Um, so I'll give you an example um, in the employment context. Um, you know, in my job, for example, here at the commissioner's office, the public service agency has actually decided that it's not necessary for a criminal record check. So I, my employer hasn't asked me about if I have a criminal history. And if they were, it would be unreasonable because the public service agency has decided that this job does not require a criminal record check. So that would just be an example of, you know, they might want to know it, but they can't actually find out about it. Um, and then age, you can ask, but only where appropriate. So if it's over 55 building, for example. Okay, so income and employment, and, and all this stuff is set out in greater detail in the guidelines on our website. Um, so you can do it um, in limited circumstances. So if you don't have adequate references, then yeah, you can definitely try to seek out more information to satisfy yourself that this uh, individual can pay the rent. Um, staking info cannot be required, but obviously if you're going to be automatically taking uh, money out every month, um, you can get that information once, you, once they're a tenant. 
Um, so criminal record check, it's tread very lightly, um, only where appropriate. So in our guidelines, we talk about um, if you've got a daycare in your uh, next to where you're renting out to a tenant, um, then that might be a unique circumstance where you would require some criminal um, history information. But generally speaking, you would not require this information. It would not be considered objectively reasonable under PIPA. Um, credit reports, um, is it reasonable? So, um, you know, we have had situations where some landlords, so, so let me just back up for a second. On the application form, and our guidelines say this, you can certainly ask for consent to run a credit check. That's fine. Um, but then we suggest that you only, and I'm sure for economic reasons, it's easier to only run the credit report um, if you are actually going to offer a tenancy to the person and if there's reasons why you would still need to know that they have good credit. So if you're absolutely sure already that they do have good credit or you're not concerned at all about them paying the rent, then you wouldn't also run a credit report. That would be potentially offside PIPA because it wouldn't be reasonable to collect that additional information. However, I understand from speaking with landlords that in many cases it is necessary to figure out um, you know, what their credit history is like. Um, the social insurance number, you're not prohibited from prohibited from collecting it, but it's best to avoid collecting it wherever possible because it's such sensitive information. And under the PIPA law, once you collect that information, you are responsible for it. So if there's a privacy breach, um, it could be quite um, intense to try to mitigate the harms, right? You might be having to offer um, credits, credit monitoring to affected individuals, et cetera. Okay, so tenant reports only with consent and where appropriate. Um, court and tribunal records are prescribed sources of publicly available information. So uh, without getting in the weeds too much, sec section six of PIPA um, says that there are certain prescribed sources that you can check. So these include court records, tribunal decisions, newspaper articles, um, professional directories, so the lawyer lookup or looking up if someone's a doctor. Um, it does not say social media. So a very, very common misconception is that if somebody posts something on Facebook or another social media platform, that's fair game. We see it in employment screening. We see it in tenant screening. In your private life, it is absolutely certainly appropriate to, you know, if you're becoming friends with someone or dating someone, you can look them up on the web. Um, but when you're um, when you're subject to PIPA, it is not fair game. So for example, here at the commissioner's office, like we never ever run internet searches on people before we're hiring them um, because it's not, not fair game. Um, and then the human rights code. So just obvious areas where, you know, it's as important considerations to weigh if they're on the slide and, and you just don't want to get into a situation where you're actually not going to rent to somebody for completely legitimate reasons, but then if they were to later find out that like you checked out their blog or something and you decided to not rent to them because of their, you know, um, their sexual orientation, their gender, or one of the other, you know, protected categories, um, then that could be really difficult because really you might have not rented to them for a legitimate reason, but you might have over collected when you're trying to um, determine if they're a suitable tenant. Okay, so after a tenancy is established, we'll just uh, go over this one uh, briefly. I'm coming towards the end, and I know I'm really excited for the Q&A period. So um, more detailed information when necessary. You can get that license plate uh, number after they become a tenant. You don't need to get it before. Insurance policies where appropriate, such as if your insurer requires proof that your tenant has insurance, um, and information needed to collect a debt. You do not need consent for that. So if there's a debt out there, uh, other organizations can share information with you, and you can collect it without consent to the tenant. Um, okay, so access and protection. This is a huge one. I mean, I think we're all familiar with the Life Labs breach, Uber had a breach, there's just all kinds of privacy breaches. So the, the best thing to do is to collect as little as possible and to keep it for as less time as you need it because um, then you're less susceptible to a breach. Uh, personal information is, is a liability. Um, so generally, landlords must provide personal information upon request. Uh, that's another reason not to keep too much stuff because people have an, a right. Uh, some of you in the public sector might uh, be aware of FOI requests. You can do a similar thing under PIPA, but only for your own information. Uh, you need to make reasonable security arrangements to protect personal information. So using encrypted email, locking up the filing cabinet. You know, you can keep it in your house, but make sure it's locked. 
if you are engaging in any sort of surveillance, so video surveillance, you would need to have that on an encrypted connection. It would have to be on a machine that's secure, that other people can't be snooping uh, at, the, at the footage. Um, and keep personal information inaccessible to unauthorized third parties. So kind of what I was just saying. Um, I don't know if this applies to anyone on the webinar today, but for not-for-profit organizations, you can collect personal information to meet housing criteria. So if you're a nonprofit and you offer housing to a certain religious group, for example, then at that point, it's appropriate to collect information to ensure that that prospective tenant um, fits within the criteria for your nonprofit. And the Human Rights Act uh, speaks to that. Landlords need consent to take photos of tenants' apartments to display in rental ads. Um, sorry, I've got this bullet up here. Bullet up here. I think the really important bit is that um, you, sorry, you wouldn't need consent if there wasn't any personal photos or effects uh, of the photo in the photographs. So I'm sure many of you do this already, but just being really careful that there's nothing about the tenant and the photos are just of the unit, not you know family photos or documents or anything like that. Um, great. Well, I think that is the end of my presentation. So I will stop sharing my screen and turn it back to Hunter for the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Uh, that's great. Um, that was a, a great presentation. Lots of really, really useful information there. Um, so we're going to go into our Q&A, uh, and I see that people have sent in quite a few questions, so that's great. We really appreciate your, your questions coming in. Uh, if you haven't already submitted a question and you, you're, you would like to, go ahead. It's in the, there's a Q&A box um, to, tool there to allow you to send in those questions. So uh, let's start with uh, the first question that we have here is around criminal record checks. Um, so, you know, as landlords and housing providers, you know, the, the main aim at tenant selection is to protect both the existing tenants um, and the physical property as well. And one way to reduce, reduce those risks is to make sure that the person uh, that you're renting to is, is not going to do harm to, to the property or to other people. Um, with that in mind, I know you covered criminal record checks, um, but would they be, you know, valid in a situation where um, there's a potential of a violent criminal past? Uh, and these things are generally public record, so is it then prudent uh, for landlords to pre-screen pre and reject applications with those types of records? Yeah, thank you for that question, Hunter. I think it's a really important one. Um, so I'm just, and I'm just looking at our guidance now. Um, I think the thing is that criminal past, information about someone's criminal past can be really stigmatizing. It's really sensitive information. Um, so we're, our, our, our guide says that a landlord may only collect information about an individual's criminal history for purposes that a reasonable person would consider appropriate in the circumstances and only for the purposes that they disclose to the prospective tenant. So what I was going to say on this is that really the reference check is the more appropriate place to do this. Um, so if, if, the, if the tenant has good references, you know, the fact that they may have been involved with an assault or a theft 10 years prior or, you know, in a different context really is probably not reasonable to collect if you've had all these good references. Um, it will be context specific. If you, if you uh, do some reference checking and there's a question about are they violent or you have some other reason to believe that they're going to damage the property, then you should document that, go to the tenant and ask them about it. And then if you're still concerned, you could say, well, you know, maybe at that point you'd want to run a criminal record check, but it would really only be in extraordinary circumstances. So uh, there, there need to be a reason. Right. Back to you, so, yeah, so, so as you mentioned, of course, in the presentation, something like the daycare and the building, sort of thing, protecting those vulnerable tenants or, or vulnerable occupants. Exactly, exactly. And it goes back to the whole thing of like, in your personal life, you might want to know that and you might even as a landlord want to know it, but PIPA puts restrictions on it. It just, it just does. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so we have someone who received a letter from a lawyer. Uh, that got a, a um, from the Supreme Court of British Columbia judgment um, on on one of their tenants 
for, for a sum of money um, that was owed to, owed to a third party. Um, and their lawyer asked for a copy of the tenancy agreement. Is that something that would be reasonable for a landlord to provide? Um, so it would be reasonable and authorized if it was necessary to collect the debt. Now, not seeing obviously the, the judgment in the agreement, it strikes me that that would be overkill. And we do see that a lot. Like they might need some elements of information from the agreement, but to require the agreement in its entirety is actually a really good question because we frequently would have complaints to our office where, and this is, it may be landlords, but it may be other organizations are wanting like whole pages of documents and they don't actually require all that information. So yeah, it would be good to press back a little bit in that case and say, okay, well, why do you need the whole tenancy agreement? What purpose? And if they say, well, we need to collect a debt, then say, okay, well, what part of this information do you need to collect a debt and, and do it that way? Right. So, so limit the information that you're providing them to really what is necessary. Absolutely. So if, for example, they needed to know the tenant's current address, then and, it, and the landlord was satisfied that that was needed to collect a debt, you could disclose that information. And if it's over the phone, I really recommend that the landlord make a note to themselves. So send an email to themselves or do something saying like on such and such a date, I disclose this information on the phone to this person for this reason. And it can just be like notes. It doesn't have to take a lot of time, but it just, you know, creates a bit of a record of what happened. So as a follow up to that, would the person requesting this information require a court order to request this? Um, mm, yes, if it's a citizen, I'm just pausing. If it's police, they don't need a court order. And this is really interesting. So there's some, we have uh, landlords do different things. So some landlords, a police, will, a police officer would come to them and say, I need this information. You should always say, okay, well, can you give me your file number, please? Because you want to confirm, if anyone questions it later on, then it was a legitimate police investigation. Um, but you also, a landlord could say, no, I'm not, dis I could disclose it to you under the act, but it's discretionary and I'm not going to give it to you until you come back with a court order. So if, in that case, it's the landlord's choice. They can either wait and say no police officer and come back with a court order, um, or they can choose to disclose the information if they want to without consent of the tenant. All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so going to digital um, security, uh, and I know you touched on this. Um, I think you actually already answered this question, but I just want to ask it again, make sure that, that we, we have a firm understanding of this. Is there a requirement for servers for your cloud-based information to be located in Canada? Great question. No, it is not a requirement that it's located in Canada. And I'll just add on that for any of you who do work in the public sector, there are requirements under FIPA, the public sector law, about keeping information in Canada. But PIPA does not have that requirement. So thanks, Hunter. Perfect. Thank you. So is there something... Um, some type of template um, that that you have for landlords to use when responding to tenants who are requesting to have all of their information uh, sent to them regarding privacy issues? That is a really good question. And the answer is no, we don't. But it's something that I'll take to our manager of intake. I think that's a really good idea. Um, the reason I think that we don't have one is that we're pretty um, flexible in terms of we just require it's usually an evidence of an email um, or a written letter just saying that you've responded. So either, you know, here's your stuff or I'm not giving you your stuff and here's why. So as long as uh, the person, the landlord, either gives them the information or does not give them the information um, and says why they're not giving it to them, um, then, then that's fine. That's all that needs to happen. And then the individual can complain to us if they want to. Um, I should take this opportunity to say as well that I would say 90% of our complaints, like if, if a landlord's not giving a tenant some information that the tenant thinks they want, they're, they're entitled to have under the law, it will go to one of our investigators, but really quickly the investigator can either call up the tenant and say, look, I'm sorry, that's a legal opinion about you. And under PIPA, the landlord does not have to give you that legal opinion. Or 
the, the investigator might call the landlord and say, you know, I've looked over the request and actually, you know, I think this person's entitled to this information. And usually that the landlord might say, okay, well, I wasn't sure. So I decided to withhold it. But if you're telling me I can release it, then I'll release it and we'll conclude the matter. So we're really here to help facilitate both sides. We're, we're remedial, not punitive. Right. And I think that's a, a, a really clear, uh, a good point to bring up uh, is that it is about informing people. Uh, you know, most people aren't acting from uh, a point, uh, a place of, of malice or, 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 or anything like that. They don't want to, not wanting to harm the other person or, or take information they don't necessarily need. But being informed is, is really what often solves that problem. Absolutely, absolutely. And we recognize here at the commissioner's office that we're all really busy and especially landlords and small business owners, they're juggling so many different hats that it's completely reasonable that they may not be super familiar with PIPA and that's what we're here for. Fantastic. So uh, are landlords permitted to ask for copies of T4s or recent pay slips to verify employment and, and or income? Um, and this is especially kind of important uh, of a question because when it comes to checking references, most HR departments are, are generally not willing to provide too much information aside from confirming that someone is in fact an employee for perhaps a period of time. Um, so is, is this type of checking and, 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 and documents, are these something that could be requested? Um, we would really discourage it for the reason I mentioned earlier about over collection. So for example, again, I'll just use my workplace because I'm familiar with it. RHR will give a letter, a signed letter mailed directly from the employer saying, you know, Caitlin Linusky works here. She's worked here for this long and this is what we pay her. And that really should be sufficient. Um, the T4 will have all kinds of other information that would not be required to make that assessment. So, so no, you really shouldn't be collecting that information. Okay. So we'll just go through a few more questions. We have a bit, we, we do have still have some time. Are you good to, to go for a few more questions, Caitlin? Yeah, that sounds great, Hunter. Thanks. Great. Um, so on that topic, what, I mean, what type of employment information are landlords allowed to, to ask for when it comes this to talking to an employee reference? Right. No, this is great. And this is one where I wish we were all in person. I know we can't be because of COVID, um, because I'd turn it back to the audience. I mean, I, I am not a landlord, so I, I'm not sure what would be needed. And what I wanted to say back to the group, and I know we can't interact in the normal in-person way, is like, why would you need that information? So for example, if the person, if the person's employer, and you have no reason to think that they're lying, says, you know, this person's worked here this long, we pay them this much, um, then I guess it's like, like, why would you need to know what they do for a living? I mean, again, it kind of crosses into that realm of curiosity or bias if you don't like a particular kind of employment. But as long as someone's like, you know, lawfully employed, then it doesn't appear to me why it would be necessary to get like kind of, are you getting at Hunter or is the, is the person with the question start talking about like what, what they do for a living? Right. So really keeping it limited to, you know, is it stable employment that they've worked at for a period of time? Does it match what they've told you? Um, and, and then, of course, trying to trying as much as possible to, to verify income. Absolutely. And that could be done through a credit check. Um, I suppose a redacted pay stub might be required if there was some way but I mean like again it would depend on the circumstances because usually the employer you know if, if the business in town says oh yeah they're on the payroll we've been paying them so there wouldn't really be the need it strikes me to also see the pay stub yeah Fair enough. okay thank you so when it comes to privacy you know we we often talk about you know protecting personal information from outsiders so protecting that personal information that you take on on tenants and, and applicants and making sure that people outside of your business don't have access to it but from my understanding and from the guidelines we also want to make sure that we're pr protecting it within our organization as well so generally who should have access to the information on a tenant's file uh things like the you know the, the credit rep, copy of a credit report, social insurance number, 
um, all that, those personal details. Should it be protected? Should, can anyone within a company look at that or should it be protected in some way? Great question. Yeah, it should be really, really restricted. So, you know, you are the landlord, of course, running a business. So if there's another family member who could have access to that filing cabinet or someone in the business, but like it, it, it's need to know. If you basically know need, need to know and keeping it really, really tight. So if someone in your organization is uh, charged with running a credit check, say, then yeah, they need to look at the social insurance number and the name to run the credit check, et cetera. But the results of the credit check or any other details on the application would just be for the landlord making the decision about the individual and it really shouldn't go to anybody else um, including family members of course or other people in your organization um, unless they they have a job to do that they need to see that information and one thing certainly is if you do have a computer that's like your personal life computer and your landlord life computer you want to make sure that um, there's it's locked down in some way so that another family member or household member using that computer can't you know double click on the yellow folder and see everything we have seen that happen before so same thing in organizations right the folders should be a lockdown in some way yeah that's a really good point that you bring up about personal computers i mean most landlords and most of our members you know they're you're small business owners you have one rental unit uh, maybe two and you're not necessarily going to go out and purchase a separate computer to run run this business on uh, from you know your your everyday computer that you're you're watching Netflix on and and going on Facebook. So yeah. you know having that makes sense. And I think one of the things that you'd mentioned in one of the previous presentations we had you speak at, you mentioned the idea of having a separate profile, a uh, separate login for business, yeah. which I thought was a really good point. Oh, thank you, Hunter. Thanks. Yeah, I think it really just goes back to that asset classification. And actually, that's one time, too, where cloud computing can be on your side. Because if you do have a secure email address that you only use for your business, it's great because you can you're not storing anything on your laptop. And if you have a, uh, and I, I know people say this all the time, but long passwords, at least 10 characters, I would really, really encourage everyone for, I mean, for your personal life, you can use shorter ones if you want to, but for your landlord stuff, at least 10 characters and not something that has been used for another account because that's such a vulnerability. But so let's assume you have a good secure email service. Um, you have at least 10 characters on your password. You don't share your password with anybody that, you know, anyone else, then all your correspondence and all your documents could be on that on that server, if that makes sense. So you're using your laptop and the information's on there. AKA if your laptop gets stolen, um, you can just say, I don't actually have any personal information on my laptop. It's all on my whatever account, you know, which can be accessed from anywhere. Does that, uh, does that make sense? <laughs> that does make sense. That's a, a really actually great point. Uh, certainly there are some, you know, we talk a lot about kind of the security pitfalls that can happen with cloud computing, but certainly, you know, from that point of view, it can, can definitely be a benefit. Yeah, definitely, because so, a lot of players do security better than you or I could. <laughs> definitely. Um, so uh, one of the, another question here about surveillance, you brought, you brought the topic up during, during your presentation. Uh, I think you, you, you know, covered it fairly well, but there are a few questions that have come up on this. Um, what, I mean, really, what would warrant the use of surveillance in things like, say, apartment hallways or entries and, and parking lots and just common areas in general? Yeah, um, you know, it's, I'm pausing here because there's such a divide between, I think, what the public expects and what the case law says. Um, it's, the, it's quite a high bar. So let's pretend, or let's just take an example where, there's a hallway, um, so maybe someone's got a few units and someone keeps vandalizing it and it always happens at night, right? Then it might be appropriate to put up a camera with signage saying, you know, this is subject to video surveillance and do it for a two week period to try to like catch who keeps vandalizing the hallway. Um, that might be a targeted short term surveillance. Um, let's say you have a garbage area and people are throwing either hazardous materials in the garbage or whatever try other steps first so just making sure the area is secure so that aka it would only be a tenant probably who would be doing it um, maybe talk to your tenant say like i've noticed there's been some garbage problems you know do all these other steps 
um, if you continued to have real problems, um, you could, I would suggest actually even putting up signs saying like you can't dump stuff in here that you're not supposed to dump and then maybe put up surveillance signs saying we're doing surveillance and then and then you could run surveillance for a little bit again to try to correct the behavior. But I think what we see a lot of times, um, and this is, I mean, we could do a whole session on this, is that buildings are hardwired for surveillance. So increasingly, and, and I, had to, I think I've shared this at another presentation, the building here at the commissioner's office, we moved in here, oh, I don't know, about 10 years ago, and the developers had put cameras all over the place. And our uh, senior director at the time actually had them um, disabled and taped over <laughs> because the building, we did not feel we were authorized by law to surveil the public coming in who we serve. And there's other public offices in this building that we serve, and we didn't think that they should be subject to surveillance. So that's a long-winded way of saying that if you try all the alternative measures and there's a real end game and a real purpose to having the surveillance, um, then and it's a reasonable purpose, then you could have it. So again, a say a dog going to the bathroom where they shouldn't be going to the bathroom, that might not reach the bar of surveillance, but property damage or serious safety issues that are repeated and other measures don't fix the problem may warrant surveillance. Right, okay. So I'm just going to just go through our questions one more time and just check to see. I know there's quite a few questions, uh, but we are kind of getting near the end. So uh... may I just say too that um, please, if anyone on the call does have additional questions, it's info at oipc.bc.ca. We usually try to email you back and answer within three to five business days. Fantastic. That's a really great, uh, great service. Um, <laughs> So uh, one of the questions that's come up here is, uh, how do criminal record checks differ from some of the screening services available online? And I know that you know, we've talked about things like uh, credit checks, but other tenant uh, screening services. Right, oh, I'm so glad someone uh, brought this up. Um, so the law is developing in this area, but I would say that there are a lot of red flags. So there are some companies that are developing products that won't only um, give you a credit score, they'll scour social media or they'll purport to scour all kinds of other records and give you some kind of a score um, or, or an impression of the individual. So there's, there's mirrored problems. I'll just spend one or two minutes going over them. Um, there's requirements in PIPA to ensure that if you make a decision about somebody, you're making a decision based on accurate information. And a lot of these companies have proprietary algorithms where you can't actually really know like how they're making their decision. They can tell you, but you can't look into that because it's a proprietary computer code that's looking at social media or other sources. Um, another problem is that, I mean, we all know social media is so, um, what you see is not necessarily reality. So there could be a picture of someone with a gun in a photo and then that would lower their score. I'm just being hypothetical here, but what the algorithm doesn't know is that that was a Halloween costume. So they've like lowered the person's score because they saw a gun in the photo, but it was out of context. So I would really, um, say that there are a lot of legal compliance challenges from using anything other than um, a credit score or if there's a reporting service by consent. So say tenant pay habits and the tenant has consented to reporting those pay habits, that would be a different situation than just um, scraping the web, so to speak. Yeah, great Certainly. question. Well, thank you so much, Caitlin, for, for joining us today and presenting this, this very, very uh, timely information. Um, and thank you to all of our attendees uh, and for your, your attentive questions. Um, that's, that's great. We really appreciate that. Hopefully we're to get to, to, uh, uh, to all of them or as many as we can. And as Caitlin mentioned, you can certainly reach out uh, to their office as well for further information. And of course, we at Landmark BC provide information regarding uh, the Residential Tenancy Act and tenancies in general uh, through our helpline. Uh, and again, I also want to just uh, do a special thank thank you and shout out to our sponsor Haddock and Company. Um, they make these these webinars possible. Um, so again, thank you to our sponsor today's sponsor Haddock and Company. And thank you all, and stay tuned for our next webinar. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak today, Hunter. Best thank to you, you and everyone on the call. <laughs> Definitely, thank you.